public data lake with the Prime Minister of India. And what's special about that was not that it's a big data lake, because who cares? We do, but otherwise. It was built in just 12 months by an eight-member team, many of whom had never pushed a line of code to production before. And so this was only possible because of this internal tooling that we built out to really improve our own collaboration. And that tool is the basis for Atlan. But more fundamentally, like this change happened because we helped our own diverse data work better. And that's not just our story, right? This is a story of just about every one of you who are here today. We are so incredibly diverse today. We're not just analytics engineers, but we're also analysts and BI folks and marketing analysts and project managers and program managers and business folks. Like, data people are so diverse today. And that diversity isn't a bug in our system. That diversity is a feature of today. But that doesn't really make it easier for us to work together. And so that's why we've assembled this really amazing panel of people who have not just figured out how to work together better, but who have figured out how to lead really amazing data teams together. So I'm really excited to get things started by introducing our panelists. I just realized I forgot DBT's whole introduction. That's fine. <laughs> you did it. Sorry. Um, whoops. So, so I'm just going to go ahead and introduce our panelists here. So right here is Chase Giltner from Pluralsight. He leads, so Pluralsight is a company that's advancing the world's tech workforce, and his team builds a data warehouse using Kafka, Snowflake, and DBT. Right here in the middle is Jonathan, who leads the data platform team at Snap Commerce. Oops. Um, so Jonathan's leading a team of data engineers and analytics engineers. Um, and Snap Commerce helps people with low incomes save money and build credit. He's worked on data teams at Shopify and Instacart, and he runs the Toronto Modern Data Stack Meetup. And then Erica over here is from DBT, and she leads the internal data team there. Um, she's one of the youngest leaders at the company and leads with a people-first approach, regularly sharing her thoughts and learnings in places like Substack and Twitter. So you might have heard from her. So I'm going to start with some preset questions on these topics. But more importantly, oh no, no, no. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> this was going to be a live Q&A, but Slido doesn't like me. So never mind. I'm going to monitor Slack. So anyone virtually or here in person, if you have ideas, we are going to pull your top voted questions into the panel at the end. So go ahead and just comment in our channel. That's Coalesce, the secrets of. Um, and we were going to do it via Slido, but we're not. So go ahead and if you have any questions for the panelists, you can put them in there, or you can upvote other people's questions. So let's see. We're going to go back to here. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started. So I want to start things off with something a little bit controversial. So let's start with the biggest mistake that you've made as a data team. Erica, you look ready to go. Always ready to go, talking about my failures. Um, so. Christine pointed out something that is like the elephant in the room. I'm one of the youngest uh, leaders in DBT labs and kind of like in the industry. And so I think that when I first started my role, I was interviewing and talking to a lot of leaders in this space, trying to figure out like, do I belong? Like, what am I doing wrong? Like, how do I fight this imposter syndrome? And so I think that a lot of times we feel like we have to emulate other people in the industry. We have to emulate what other people are doing. You know, go on data Twitter, be super loud about the things that you're working on. But that kind of like comes from almost a disingenuous place because um, for you to be following other people are doing rather than leaning into what are the things that like you're good at? Why were you given this manager role? And so I did not come from a data background. I was, I'm not a math person. I, fit, I didn't fail. I got a C in my last math course in college. Um, but I'm really good at people. 
and I'm really good at working with other people and cultivating other people's strengths. And so after I kind of like leaned into that and thought about, you know, good work speaks for itself. And so if you're able to be a good person, lead with good work that you do and be honest about it, then I think that your team sees that and other people who you would want to also be on your team will see that when you advertise for roles, when you think about like, how do you want to grow and thinking about like what made me feel really good as an IC. And so I think that being more aware of my strengths as a leader rather than trying to emulate other people. Um, I didn't experience that feeling until like this year. So yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, that's really great. Thanks a lot for having me on this panel. Um, so I'm going to also build on what Erica said, and I think a lot of the advice that you'll hear today is really dependent on your specific personality and the context that you're in. Um, so I personally, as a leader, try to practice uh, what I call situational leadership, which basically means that um, you, you modulate how hands-on and how hands-off you are depending on the situation and depending on the needs of the, uh, of the individual that you're working on. Um, so people who you know, might have personalities that tend to micromanage, um, they tend to overlead. And, and you want to avoid that, especially when the person you're working with has already demonstrated the ability to do the task at hand. Uh, someone like me, where I, I'm a more of a naturally trusting person, um, you know, I, 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 in the past, I, I've underled, which means that I wasn't really there for the individual when they needed extra guidance, um, and, and that had led to impacts on the team. So I think the biggest mistakes I've made, I've made have been situations where I wasn't there uh, to the extra capacity for, uh, for sp people on my team, which you know, wasn't fair to the team and wasn't fair to the individual themselves. Uh, whoa, that's loud. <laughs> Wow. Uh, I'll, I'll take this question in a different direction. Um, biggest mistake, uh, a, a very like pointed mistake. Uh, I used to manage a data and analytics team for a basically a consulting firm that managed class action lawsuits. And let me tell you, if you send a report with data that is incorrect to uh, a court and a judge and attorneys, there is nothing in this world that is like the same wrath as attorneys and judges noticing something was wrong with your data. Um, and yeah, there was this one specific time where we sent a, a series of reports that were just completely incorrect. We just completely filtered down to the wrong set of data. Uh, and that was just a huge learning experience for our team of like, okay, we need to implement new policies for QAing and peer reviewing, and has definitely changed my perspective on uh, how we review work since then. So, um, yeah. I think everyone who's worked in data has at one point generated a report and given it to stakeholders or external people and then realized that was completely wrong. Yeah, so why don't we just go from there? How do you avoid that? What's your biggest process or hack or learning around trying to make sure that you don't hand off a dashboard and someone goes, this number looks wrong? Um, I, I can, I mean, I can, I guess I, I can talk, talk about this from the, the point of, um, I think everything that you do as a data team is really dependent on your credibility and, and trust in data. Um, and so, when I am prioritizing work for my team, you know, beyond uh, the, the projects that are going to drive the business forward, I, I also, you know, pay special attention to things that are going to help us preserve credibility uh, and trust. I've been in situations in the past where, you know, there wasn't a lot of trust in the data, um, and it, it's uh, it's not a great environment to be in. And you know, we actually did things like we would run regular NPS surveys across the company just to see if we were trending in the right direction and our score was improving. People were starting to trust in the data. So, um, you know, if you do find yourself in an environment of low trust, then having some data to, to sort of track your progress is good. But yeah, I think you have to. Tr there's a trade-off between taking on those initiatives to to improve. Um, uh, the data trust and quality. So, you know, that can be anything from tooling out there uh, to uh, extra review processes, pairing sessions. Um, but also, like, you don't want to be, like, pumping the brakes every time there's, like, a 
random failing test or there's a, a hot fix in, in prod. Like you just, you want to make sure that the, the, the things that are breaking or the quality issues are like actually material for the business and emphasize those rather than just tackling every single thing. Because there's always going to be things breaking. I think everybody knows that here. Yeah, I think for me to, to add on to that, uh, I, I feel like the big uh, solutions there for us have been a combination of uh, always making sure that you have multiple eyes on things and having like a standard QA and peer review process. Um, and then additionally, you know, I'm sure every, you know, everyone knows this here, but like the source control and versioning of DBT has like fixed so many issues of somebody deploying some new stored procedure report and totally messing things up and not having like a history there. Um, and then, you know, having like a proper data catalog with, uh, you know, statuses and verification of data um, has helped us out a lot. So. Um, so I think that for our team at least, we do like iterative changes. And so there's like the net new version of like, you create this new model, you create this new dashboard, but when you do that, having like iterative check-ins with your stakeholders and building that trust of saying, does this number look right? This is a gut check, yeah. Um, this is a gut check. Um, and then delivering the final thing and making sure you can t chat like one-on-one -on -one with a stakeholder or a, you know, a team and saying like, does this look right before we like, we announce this to the greater company. And so that's like net new. And then iterative is like, you change a new DVT model, it's like a critical model, but you know there are certain BI dashboards that touch it. And so comparing that between your prod and dev schema is really important. But then like, obviously there are times where a number looks off and just owning up to it and saying like, saying, like, oh yeah, this product looks off, let me investigate all right, we added some unit tests to make sure this doesn't like break anything. And then just like communicating with your stakeholders because at least everyone just wants to know that like their feelings are heard and that they experience this pain point and you recognize it and then you had a solution to fix it. So that actually leads perfectly into something I wanted to talk about, which is, so in the past, Erica, you've talked about how you've tried to be upfront and vulnerable and transparent and in doing that, you've created a, tried to create a culture of uh, trust in your organization, in your data team. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I talk about feelings a lot. Um, so uh, whenever someone joins the team, uh, we have team values that we established when we first chartered the first, the first members of the team last year. And every new direct report I hire, I send them a care package to like thank them for coming to the team. I send them our values. I send them a handwritten letter saying, there's a lot that I don't know that you know, and there's a lot that you may not know that I can help you with. And even if we don't know it, we'll figure it out together. And so I think that you kind of emulate the culture you want by leading and by showing them, um, where if I'm having like a really bad mental health day, I'll tell my team, hey, I like, it's been a bad few days, I'm gonna be working at 50% capacity or I'm taking a nap in the middle of the day, just so that way they know that they can have that space to do that. Um, I have like had mistakes where I work a lot, I work really late at night, my team sees that, and even though I can say, don't do, it, don't do what I do, they're gonna do it because you have given them the example of doing that. And so um, if I know that some of my direct reports, you know, we do like daily async check-ins and they put like, what, what are they feeling? And if I see like two days in a row, they're feeling tired or stressed, I reach out to them, I'm like, hey, what's going on? Um, do you need to take like a half day tomorrow? How are you feeling? Because regardless, like work and personal, like you can't separate them. And so you might as well just acknowledge it and see how can I help lift you up? Um, and so we have that vulnerability, we have that transparency. We're also like not that serious. We're like, we're, we're just people doing this thing, typing our computers. So I think that like by doing that, it has created like a very comfortable psychological safe culture, and also talking about their work like their workplace traumas, like having that first first onboarding check in with them and saying, "What have you experienced that you did not like in your past working spaces, and how can I help lift you up so that way you don't experience those things again?" Because at least you have that context, because um, everyone's different. Yeah, if I can add on to that, I think when you start becoming a leader, <clears throat> and especially as you rise up in the ranks, you, you, you might get sort of narrowly focused on 
things like how, delivering projects on time or creating your roadmap or, or um, you know, doing all the things that like help the, the business move forward, help your platform move forward. And I see sometimes people neglect like the fundamental human component, which is, um, you know, really understanding and anticipating the emotional needs of your team. Um, being there to support them and, and being, you know, especially given in, in our world, there, there's a lot of people who uh, potentially aren't, aren't communicating as much their, their needs, you know, especially on the engineering side. People are not necessarily the most forthright about how they're truly feeling. So being able to understand that, anticipate that, and draw that out, I find has really established a strong culture of, um, you know, psychological safety and, and support. And, and that, you know, when I ask my team members, like, what are they like working on the team? They, they say that I, they feel like I'm there for them. So I just encourage any new d data leaders to not neglect that part of your job, is really just to be them, treat them as human beings first, um, as a, emotive human beings, and then, you know, that in some, some places, that in some ways that comes first before like making sure that uh, you're, you're delivering on time and, and things like that. Uh, yeah, so for culture, I think, um, it's not on. <laughs> does, does. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so for culture, um, I think that culture is a really hard thing to build. And I think that everyone here has probably been a part of like some happy hour or escape room that they didn't want to be a part of. <laughs> and that's not, you know, it. As an individual contributor, like you don't look at that stuff as, as culture. So I think as a leader, if, if you're trying to build culture, in, instead think about what you want to foster um, I instead of trying to force some sort of culture. And for me specifically, I wanted to, f to foster um, like just collaboration, essentially. And so how we've sort of solved for that is uh, we, we basically, like three times a week, have large blocks of time, like multiple hour blocks that sort of overlaps with everyone's time zone um, that everyone can use that time to uh, pair program any sort of mobbing or uh, working group session time that they need. And engineers will sort of um, self-organize and stand up to be like, okay, I need to work on these things and is, is anyone available to hop on during our pairing time? Uh, and that has gotten people to work closer together, uh, get them to know each other, and I think is really like the best for, for culture building uh, in a remote environment. Um, it's, it's something that's really hard to, to sort of build um, in a remote environment. And, and talking about like trust, um, I think a, like a quick thing that I've sort of learned for um, instilling trust is like, any sort of like automated active status, like in Slack or Teams or whatever it may be that you use, um, I encourage my team to just turn that stuff off. Maybe people uh, would disagree with that, but I have my whole team turn off the little green bubbles of everything. I don't want people just shaking their mouse to, uh, you know, keep that status active. I'd rather, um, like what Erica said, like, you know, if you need to take a nap or you need to do something else, like, I, I trust you to, you know, hit your milestones and, and uh, deliver the work, and however you want to get that done is fine with me, so. Awesome. So I'm going to throw things to some questions from the chat. Um, I'm going to combine a couple together here. So we've talked a lot about culture and cult cultural change, um, not just in how you work with your team, but also how other teams work with the data team. So how do you set the right expectations with your team and with other groups? And then how do you actually go about implementing change if the expectations you want to set aren't the right ones that are actually being used in the organization? First. <laughs> um, so we follow a semi-decentralized structure on our team. Um, I'm looking at Chase because we were just talking about what are the things we can fight about. Um, and so we have like a pretty great relationship with our stakeholders. So it's they spend like now it's going to be 50% on bed and bed works, 50% on centralized work. And so every single time. Uh, we hire a new embed like analytics engineer for a new business function. I have like docs that say like this is how we work, and 
we have like, this has says, this is the way that we roadmap, this is the way that we communicate. It's very consistent throughout the entire company because uh, we've spent a lot of time at DBT Labs thinking about what makes a good async remote working culture. And so by having that like decentralized embed structure, they already have that relationship with our team. We have roadmaps in place. They understand the initiatives that we have. We have like allotted working hours that we can like actually put towards initiatives. And so if there is ever a point where like we're feeling like, like oh, this, this doesn't feel good. This interaction didn't feel good. Um, we have a team culture and team values of fast and transparent feedback. And so if a stakeholder does something and starts like DMing one of my direct reports um, constantly and then we, they chat with me about it and they're like, what should I do? Uh, we always say like move it to an, like a public channel. Um, make sure that like all questions are publicized and give them the reason for it. Where it's like, it's not like we don't want to answer your questions or we don't want to like follow the thing that you want. It's just that chances are someone's probably going to have the same question and instead of asking one single person, you can ask eight people and also the entire company because our company is full of data practitioners. And so I think it's actually like more so not really balancing of like how does how do we work with the company, but like how do we compromise consistently and like do reiterative processes? And I also do like quarterly check-ins and like mid-quarter check-ins with all of my like stakeholder leaders to say like, okay, what feels good? What has it been feeling good? What are you thinking about? And then like being able to move forward from there. Uh, yeah, I don't have much to add to Erica's answer. That was that was great. Uh, the only thing is for new hires and junior folks, they tend to um, to require a little bit more uh, help in this regard. Uh, they're they're super eager to help. They want to work with their stakeholders. They want to help them with everything. Um, and uh, but so it it does require a bit of coaching uh, and extra anticipation to help them stay on track and, and you know, follow established processes for, for working with other teams. Um, yeah, I think uh, building on those, uh, I'm diverging from the question a bit, but um, I think really thinking about like that old framework of like people, process, tools, technology, uh, really helps for, for building a team. If you um, sort of define, you know, who are the people that we work with, what are the processes that we do internally within our team? What, you know, uh, uh, cadence of uh, ceremonies, whether it's like agile ceremonies, stand-ups, that sort of thing we have. Um, professional agreements that we have on the team and like mapping values like Erica was talking about of like what does, you know, this company value mean for our team and what do we do to contribute to that? Um, and, you know, what tools we use to uh, accomplish our work and what technology we're uh, working in and having that stuff like explicitly written out somewhere like in a confluence doc or something when you have those new hires come in you can just point to that and you can go through those things and they can kind of start to understand the scope of the team and the box that your your team operates in uh, and I think is really helpful to to sort of like uh, you know take the ocean and and you know bring the size down to like a swimming pool of what what your new team member is trying to understand and, and work in, so, yeah. Cool, I know that we are over time, so I'm gonna throw one more question from the chat, but otherwise we're gonna be here afterwards and we'll be active on Slack afterwards as well. So, last question, um, what is your number one piece of advice for a new data leader? Uh, I'll <clears throat> I'll start here. I think I will be talking from my own personal experience, which probably doesn't map to uh, to everyone here. But in my experience, when I first started managing people, I actually struggled a lot because I felt like I wasn't being productive. I was transitioning away from writing code, you know, pretty much all day, to being in tons of meetings uh, and and working with with people and, and other stakeholders and, and coaching my team. And I felt like I wasn't really doing much, accomplishing a lot. Um, and so it took about six months for my mindset to shift to the point where I realized that not only is, you know, the reason why I'm doing this job is because, you know, my, my ability to influence my team uh, and the direction of our, of our team is, is um, 
in, in more important than me, you know, getting my hands dirty and writing some code. But I actually found it super rewarding as well. You know, there's, it's, it's, uh, it's actually in some ways more rewarding to, uh, you know, take, for example, an intern to full time to senior than it is to, um, you know, complete a bunch of story points in a sprint. So I thought um, if other folks are sort of making that transition, there might be like a adjustment period where you, you feel like you're, you're not doing as much as you used to be, but you know, it will come in time um, and you need to like re rejig your, your thought process to my, my sole responsibility now is making my team execute well to the best of their abilities. Yeah, talking about uh, accomplishments, um, I think it's really important as, as a new team, you know, you're trying to figure out what you do and how you deliver and, and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, it's, it's usually pretty fast paced that you're, you're deploying and delivering things and changing patterns all the time. Um, and my biggest piece of advice is to, is to, you know, take time to celebrate achievements for the team. So as you do like, uh, you know, maybe it's a sprint review or maybe it's retros or something like just going through a, like a simple list of like we uh, as a team we did x y and z and you have that list and you have um, everything that you've built and deployed and worked on and that will take ICs out of the mindset of like oh I'm not doing enough I'm not building enough I'm not you know working fast paced enough and like zoom out a little bit and be like, oh, we actually did like so much, you know, in this sprint or in this month. Um, and celebrating those achievements is just like really important to team members to just see that we've, we have made progress. We are building a lot of new and cool things and here's what we've done, so. All right, I got two things. One is when you're starting to build your team, start figuring out what your org structure is going to look like a year from now three years from now and five years from now, and share it when you do interviews. When, and then on top of that, make sure you post your 30, 60, 90 in all of your job like postings. Like be very upfront with like what they're directly working on. If like you don't have that, then you shouldn't be hiring for that role. And um, the last thing is socialize your insights in the frame of like, this is the story of the business. And that's it. Awesome. Oh man, nothing is working. Um, I will post this in the channel. There's a final slide calling out all of our panelists, Substacks, Twitters, LinkedIn, all that fun stuff, as well as, um, as well as um, at Atlin, we just wrote a book on this topic, interviewing Erica and then so also some other really amazing data leaders. It's gonna be available at our booth tomorrow um, in, in the physical copy. And then in the deck as well, there's a QR code to get exclusive access to the digital version when it comes out after Coalesce. So please check out the deck, talk to us afterwards, talk to us on Slack. We're going to be available to keep this conversation going. And thank you all so much.